When a child learns to draw for the first time, would you give the child a small piece of paper and a pencil or would you teach the child to draw a mural? Of course, we start from something very small. Then why not teach neural networks to generate simple images before teaching them to generate high resolution images? Progressive GAN was an ICLR 2018 paper that proposes just that. It shows a simple and effective way to train GANs. In addition, the paper proposes some important implementation details and improvements in terms of image quality, variation in generated images, and training stability. They also propose a new evaluation metric for GANs. Let's try to understand progressive GANs in this video. Progressive GAN has a generator and a discriminator network. However, when you start the training, you start with just a single convolution block in the discriminator and a single convolution block in the generator that generates images of size 4x4. To train at this scale, you downsample the training images also to be of size 4x4 and use them for training. After a few iterations, you introduce another layer of convolution in both the generator and discriminator. We keep growing the networks slowly till we reach the desired resolution for the generated images. In this case, it's 1024 by 1024. Finally, we try till convergence at this resolution. By growing the network progressively, the network seems to learn high level structures first followed by finer scale details available at higher resolutions. With that overview, let's get into the details and tricks introduced in the paper. We saw that we start with a single convolution block that generates 4x4 resolution images. Now we can straight away plug in another additional convolution block that generates images of resolution 8x8 into this network. But it will be a bit of a shock to the system also, we know that GANs are very sensitive to the training setting. So the training will no doubt collapse without converging. So how do we overcome this? We simply need to introduce changes gradually to the network. In other words, we fade in the new block of convolutions, which in this case is an 8x8 block. To fade in, we introduce a new parameter called alpha and take two outputs from the 4x4 block instead of one. We then connect the new 8x8 block parallel to the existing block of 4x4. Now alpha is zero to begin with. As the training progresses, alpha is slowly increased from zero to one. The slow increment in alpha strengthens the connection between the 4x4 block and the 8x8 block and weakens the direct connection between the 4x4 block and the output. In the same fashion, we keep introducing convolution blocks to get higher and higher resolution outputs. The final architecture that generates 1024 by 1024 images as a result of progressive growing looks like this. One thing to note is that the generator is an exact mirror image of the discriminator as we exactly add the same layers in both the networks as we grow. I've been mentioning blocks of convolutions. It's simply because we have two or sometimes even three convolution layers for each resolution of the image generated. One more thing that is interesting is the absence of any deconvolution layers in the generator network that is usually present in other GAN architectures. The idea of mini-batch discrimination was introduced in this classic GAN paper in 2016. Inspired by it, Progressive GAN paper proposes a much simplified version of it called the mini-batch standard deviation. To understand it, let's take a mini-batch of say four feature maps. Let's say the feature map has a spatial resolution of 2x2. Two two. Now for each feature in this feature map, you compute its standard deviation across the entire mini batch. That will be 4x4 four four equal to 16 numbers to consider per feature. After computing 
standard deviation similarly for each feature. We now take the mean across the mini batch to get a single feature map. This is concatenated along with other feature maps and passed to the following layer in the network. Most prior GAN architectures use batch normalization that usually helps in addressing the covariate shift problem. However, in GANs, the main problem seems to be that of signal magnitudes. Let's take this example and its feature map generated by StyleGAN. You can see some dark spikes in signal and the image is not quite homogeneous. This problem is prevalent in all GANs and to address this problem, Progressive GAN introduces equalized learning rate. The idea is to explicitly scale the weights at runtime using a constant c which is inspired by this paper which asks to scale the weights of the network so we simply divide by a constant c which is equal to 1 by square root of the number of input layers the second idea in normalization is the pixel feature vector normalization that is used just in the generator network alone the equation looks a bit scary, but the idea is fairly simple. Again, let's take a mini batch of four feature maps with a spatial resolution of two by two. Let X, Y represent the spatial locations. For each feature A at location X, Y, we pick the values of all the features in the spatial location X, Y and normalize the feature. In other words, we normalize across the mini batch preserving the spatial locations. Right, those were the tricks used in the paper to improve the quality and variation. In terms of evaluation of GANs, people have been using multi-scale structural similarity metric or MSSIM. However, MSSIM doesn't seem to capture smaller effects. When we are dealing with very high resolution images like 1024 by 1024, it becomes important. So Progressive GAN introduces sliced Wasserstein distance and evaluates the generated images at different resolutions. For SWT, you first compute Laplacian permit representation for both generated and target images. To understand the Laplacian permit, let's take the image X1 on the left. Let it be of resolution 128 by 128. You first downsample the image to say 64 by 64 and then upsample the image back to 128 by 128. In this step, you would have lost some information in the image. You now compute the difference between the original and the computed image to get the Laplacian representation. Now we do the Laplacian permit for both the generated images X and target images Y. With 128 descriptors for each Laplacian permit, you get 2.1 million of those. Finally, you simply compute the sliced Wasserstein distance between the generated and the target images from the training set to obtain the metric. These are the breakdown of the main results from the paper. These are the results that compare Progressive GAN with the paper Improved Training of WGAN. They do a breakdown of the sliced Wasserstein distance for different resolutions of the output image from 16 by 16 to 128 by 128. First thing to note is the significant improvement in the numbers with progressive growing, showing that progressive growing really works. And the second thing to note is that the pixel wise normalization is quite effective too with an net best results coming from pixel-wise normalization. The additional benefit of progressive growing is that the training time goes down drastically because we are dealing with a small network and low resolution images initially. In the plots, the vertical gray line is when we stop the training. We can see that it takes just 30 hours for progressive GAN, but it takes 60 hours for the improved techniques for WGAN. These are some of the handpicked results. These are amazing. I mean, I would find it hard to accept that these people don't exist in reality. 
just to show that it is possible to generate a variety of objects and not just faces. These are results on the Elson dataset and they are equally mind-blowing. I mean, you can see the shadow of a phone kept under the sun. Wow. But we also have a double-sided horse. Whatever that means, we need to ask the neural network. As always, thank you very much for watching. I'll come up with more videos like this and please subscribe to my channel for more videos like this.